I've seen him spit in police officers' face when there was nobody but us three on a dark street in Oakland. You know? Pac almost got us killed in Richmond, Virginia. I know them brothers remember that time they backed us out of this club, this after hours place in Richmond, Virginia, four in the morning. This one cat claimed Pac stepped on a shoe and they got into a little spat and then it was like, Shh, I'm, like I'm gonna see who got the juice and said something disrespectful to Pac and Pac started cursing him out. This whole club turned against us, all black, all ghetto, after hours lounge. 10 minutes later, we're taking pictures and everybody's walking us around. We're all spread out. It was four of us there. Me, Pac, Money B, and Sophia. And uh, Pac challenged this cat and it got ugly. And then Pac was like, yo, man, shot. We out. Yo, we got beef. Uh, we didn't even know what was going on until we walked over there. Uh, so we all got next to Pac and they were backing us out of the club. Then they backed us out against the brick wall. And at the point, that I was grabbing, holding Pac, trying to get him to shut up. Still putting him in the cab, he was still challenging. It was like 40 or 50 cats that we were gonna have to fight at one point, because they were starting to build up out of the clock. Bye, you know? Fuck them California niggas. Yo, T-Roy, I got you, cat. Yeah, yeah, that's you, Mike? Yeah, that's me. Shh, shh. What? We'll send him back to Cali right? And then more and more were ganging up. And Pac was like, what? How y'all gonna do that to me? I'm not scared of none of y'all. I'm not scared of none of y'all. Ah. Saphir was the muscle cat, though. <laughs> and he said, look, why do we gotta fight all of y'all? Just me and you box right now. And he challenged the main cat who was challenging Pac while I smushed Pac into the cab because the, the more Pac talked, the matter they got. It was a no-win situation. And I was like, Pac, I'm a soldier, too. It's 40 of them, and we're from California, and it's four of us, and we're not strapped. We couldn't bring no guns to the club or nothing. That was the beginning of a big feud between Sophia and Tupac, because as soon as we got back to the hotel, Pac got on the phone. That was one of those outings I told you about when he would just pop up and do a few shows with us. As soon as he got to the phone, he called up uh, Right. First thing he did was went upstairs to our bodyguards, and DJ Fuse, and all the people who had guns, like, Fuse, I need your gun, let me borrow your gun. Yo, we need your gun, we going back, and we gonna show them niggas that they can't raise us up like that. You know? What do you mean, who got the juice? I'm gonna show them who got the juice. So our bodyguards like, all right, who else need one? Where they at? We're like, they're at a club 30 minutes away. And then Zazie looked at me and said, Greg, I told you not to wake me up with this bullshit, okay? There's no threat right now at the hotel. <sighs> Took the guns back and went to sleep. Pac em embraced his underground at first, vocally, publicly, on, on his songs. Some of that you can expect because we were like the top group in Oakland at the time. You had Hammer and In Vogue. Too Short didn't really happen yet. He was starting to. He, he didn't happen globally yet, you know. Humpty Dance threw us out into a world of around the world immediately. So being that we were so large, you can only expect people to play into it a little bit. This is my opportunity. This is my door. It was beyond that with Tupac. His loyalty went deeper than that. He, we were like family to him. You know, we got him his first apartment. He had no credit. He couldn't drive. He had no driver's license. So we used to have to work the applications and we would all pitch in and borrow a credit card and co-sign and we did all the shit we had to do. We tried to teach him how to run his bank account and how to uh, take care of his place. I could tell you stories, man, about how I'd come over to Pac's house. My best friend, Smooth, he used to sing all the falsetto shit on Digital Underground. Like, uh, sex packets, all around the world, same song. That was Smoothie Smooth. He managed an apartment building before we got the group going, and we rented Pac the G apartment in the back. And uh, <laughs> I'd come over there, and Pac would be gone out in the street with Richie Rich or somebody, you know. Like I said, he was like six years younger than me. When I met Pac, I was like 26. He was like 18 or 19. And uh, he's like seven years younger than me, so my thug, side of me was out of me. I didn't really strap no more. 
I mean, when I was 19, I was just like him, crazy. You gotta prove that to yourself in this country, you know? You gotta know that you can hang. But I was starting to choose to chill. I was just discovering white chicks and ecstasy and staying inside and not going out and lesbians and all kind of cool shit. <laughs> Pac was just discovering the streets and camaraderie and manhood, and guns, and, you know, sisters, having them. Because, you know, it's hard to get a black girl in a black neighborhood unless you got something going for you. It's not like a man, any girl really. You know, we'll take the cute chick on fries, but a girl, <laughs> you work at McDonald's, <laughs> please. Wesley Snipes said he couldn't buy pussy when he was in college. All of a sudden he got fined once it happened. So Pac was discovering sisters. He, he speaks on that in the first rhyme he ever said, clown around when I hang around with the underground. Folks who used to clown say I'm down when I come around. Gas me when they pass me. They used to diss me and harass me, but now they ask me if they can kiss me. Get some fame, people change, blah, blah, blah. He was just starting to feel that. People were recognizing him from the digital videos and from the tours and stuff, and his album was slated to come out soon. Make a note that our label, Tommy Boy, jumped over the Tupac demo to sign Gold Money, a pimp group. <laughs> But, the, you know, they didn't hear a hit single on the, on the tape. Neither did Tom Wally or Interscope. There really wasn't a hit single on Pac's first album, but Pac was on it. That passion that we know and love him for, that was there. So you really had to listen. You had to meet the man and sit down with the man. And I love Tom Wally for, for seeing Tupac. That's how we saw him. But we shopped him around. A lot of people passed over him. But he was starting to get the love. He's starting to feel it. I come to his house and all the lights would be on. He's on the first floor apartment, drapes wide open, occasionally a window open with just a screen. And this is in Oakland, not quite East Oakland, MacArthur, Lake area, still East Oakland though. You know, you, don't, you can't leave your shit open like that. He's got his digital underground gold records up, big entertainment center he bought with his first check from the Juice movie. Uh, red sofas or something. He, he, he was on some pimp shit. He had the red velour sofas. Maybe he had black sofas and red bed, I forget. But it looked lavish up inside Pac's little apartment. Wasn't much different than this. It was just a regular apartment, like six to eight hundred a month or something like that, you know. But uh, <laughs> I would climb through the window, shut some lights off, make sure the doors and windows were locked and climbed out, you know. Then I got tired of that shit. And I was like, Pac, man. I actually, him and Stretch were gone one time. I climbed in and I took all this gold records, all this equipment, and I put it in the bedroom. And I put a note on it. It was me this time, next time it might not be. And it looked like he got robbed. They told me as soon as Pac walked in, he ran back outside and started looking for who did it. And they said Stretch just fell out on his knees and said, oh shit. Oh shit, Stretch was the one who left the place open, you know? That was Pac's best friend, by the way. But uh, yeah, so another time I came over and I was like, Pac, for real, man, you're not getting a message. You can't leave your windows wide open with all these gold records and, and all your jewelry laying out on the counters and stuff. He was like, oh, I ain't worried about that. I ain't show you? Oh, went in the closet, his first AK he ever bought. He came out, because if someone come up in here, Wait. <laughs> Woo! You saw that? Shot the floor and the sofa all up. Damn near killed uh, a couple of the outlaws. They were little kids just sitting on the couch getting high. Not little kids, you know, 17, 18. It was crazy, man. But he was excited. Always had that boyish gleam in his eye, like, Whew. that Chuck D said I could rhyme with, like, Woo! You saw that? Like, this is, it's got some shit to it. Beautiful. He was always writing. You come in his hotel room, looked like a bomb went off. Blunt scrapings on every counter. Piss and shit in the toilet. Like, damn, Pac, don't you flush the toilet? Oh, <laughs> yeah. He didn't even remember that he didn't flush it because if he was sitting on the toilet writing a rhyme and the phone rang, walking to the other room, 
Yeah, yeah, what's up? All right, next week? Cool, cool, for sure. Now he's sitting in there, naked. Now somebody knocks on his door, oh shit. Throw some underwear on, go to the door. Ash and a cigarette everywhere. I was all into keeping my apartment all bellied out. It reminded me of the belly apartment, not that big, but I had the white and the black going and the silver chrome, everything, and Pac would be in there talking to me, you know what we should do tomorrow when we come out on stage, right? Yeah, Pac! $1,500 Persian rug, please, cat, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Damn, I'm sorry. I got it, I got it. All right, what was you saying? No, okay, me, you, and Mun, right? After we get off stage, yeah. oh, I did it again. <laughs> he just wasn't thinking about that mundane shit. He wasn't thinking about material things. He would wreck his cars so quick. He wrecked every car he had within a couple weeks. You know, the cigarette ashes and leaving the beers and cleaning up, his dishes would be piled up almost to the ceiling. The garbage would be piled up almost to the roof of the refrigerator. Didn't have time for that. He was busy getting it out. When you brought him a beat tape, I bet you, I don't know this for a fact, but ask Dre and Easy Mo B and other producers, when they play a tape for Pac or send him a CD with beats on it, if you were present, he'd listen to it, but he wouldn't give you an answer until he ran and grabbed his rhyme book. He'd pull his rhyme book out. I want to use that for uh, Soldier Story. It had to fit. If it didn't fit nothing in this book, I don't know, I don't know. What else you got? Let me hear something else. You know? It, it, he didn't really have an opinion over this beat is a hit and this beat isn't. It was like, how does it make this shine? It has to be the backdrop to what he was trying to say. Constantly writing, constantly working. Planes from the studio straight to the set, out of town straight to the commercial he had to film, straight back into the studio, straight to those cats' studio he promised he'd go by. Doesn't really want to go over there, but he knows how much it'll mean to them. <sighs> Hardest working man in hip hop, <laughs> hands down. First of all, Pac was one of the most virile, uh, whatever it's called, testosterone strong brothers I knew because in digital, before same song, just from his little parts on stage, he would do, I don't know if you ever heard a song, yeah, he's the packing man. And then I'd, I'd have the nose on going, you know, well, how much are they? And Pac was like, excuse me, Trooper, will you be needing any packages today? Yo, B, don't be pulling on my jacket, okay? He would do the Shock G lines. Just from that little bit of stage and the, and the little Humpty dancing he did, Pac was pulling them. Girls love Pac from day one. I'm not even talking about, whatever I'm talking about, multiply it times 10 when he became a star. I'm talking about his natural magnetism was beyond celebrity status because here I was, Humpty Hump, Shock G, whoever. MTV all day, every day, kiss you back, I get around, not I get around, kiss you back, what, same song, Humpty Dance, we were well out there. Pac still had the numbers. If we had a contest, Pac had the numbers. As soon as we showed up, he would knock one down in the dressing room before we even did sound check. Yeah, yeah, hey, I just hit that, yeah. <laughs> you know, for real? Where'd you just, just now in the dressing room, nigga. And then we'd leave sound check to go check into the hotel. He'd have a girl in the back of the bus. And then, <laughs> <laughs> you know, then later on after the show, forget about it. <laughs> but that, that's like, he's not even known. He's not a celebrity yet. We haven't even done the show yet. After the show, it's real easy to get chicks. They're just throwing themselves at you. The energy of the whole thing has everybody on a high, including the group, including the managers, the establishment owners, the audience. When a show goes down, everybody's on this communion vibe and a lot of sex jumps off. Early that day when we roll into town, Pac was betting him. You know, sometimes, like I said, two, three, before the show took place. Then after the show, then it's just trips to the lobby, pulling him upstairs, if he was in the mood, if there was no hip hoppers around. Now, if there was some MCs around that he, that he liked, I remember when we showed up in New York, he, yeah, yo, we done? 
Y'all need me till tomorrow? Yo, I'm going with them. He jump in the car with Greg Nice and Seal Smooth or, you know, just whoever. Anybody that was really about it and he thought he could learn from. But it is truly absurd to think that anybody in the hip-hop game with mild celebrity status has to rape anybody.